Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 59 of the Miami Tech Pod. I'm Caesar. This week, we have Brian and Maria with us. Will is on a little vacay. And we got a special guest with us, Michelle Bakels. Uh, she's a program director of developer health at G2I and the co-organizer at React Miami, uh, a conference within Emerge Americas. We're going to talk about Miami Tech Week. But first, Michelle, welcome to the Miami Tech Pod. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, Br Brian, Maria, how, how was your week? You know, I, I feel like uh, this is this is the calm before the storm. But Maria, we got to talk about Aspen. I mean, <laughs> that looked incredible. I, can you can you give a, the listeners a, a sneak peek who aren't following you on Instagram of uh, this Miami Tech Life uh, trip to to the snowiest place on Earth? It was amazing. Um, it was funny because I think a lot of people are like, why are Miami Tech people leaving during Miami Tech Month? But it was like a short trip to re-energize for the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, it was a big group of us, Demi and Belumio, who's been on the podcast before. He kind of organized this with Juan Pablo Capello. I guess this is like a yearly trip that they do. And so a bunch of us went out for a few days uh, and kind of, uh, I guess it was closing weekend for Aspen. So there's a big party that happens and people get dressed up and I didn't ski at all. Um, but it was, <laughs> I just, uh, enjoyed the scenery and had a good time and, you know, bonded with a bunch of more Miami tech people. Maria, did you go to Don Johnson's bar? I didn't even know there was one. So one of the like sort of infamous local stories in Aspen is that Don Johnson, Dakota Johnson's dad was famous for his own things is like a daily regular at, at some bar with some with the guy who wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Um, and apparently they're like pissed drunk every single day of the year at this bar in like Aspen and they live there and, and all that stuff. And apparently it's Thanks like a rite of this. passage to meet them if you go to Aspen. You didn't tell me this before. I would have gone. All right. Well, look, we, we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Maria, um, I was very jealous of your trip. I'm glad you all had fun. It looked like you got snowed in and delayed and all that, but um, we're also glad that you're back because this is this is like this next week is pretty wild in Miami. Um, we have a lot going on. Uh, Miami Tech Week is finally here, and one of the anchor you know events of Miami Tech Week is of course Emerge Americas. Um, you know, we've we've had Melissa on the podcast to give us a preview. Some programming notes is that we're actually going to be, you know, on the conference floor at Emerge. Um, so, you know, a couple of days after you're listening to this, we're going to be speaking with Felice, uh, the the CEO of Emerge. We're going to be, um, you know, have some some fun things in store. But one of the things that uh, is a conference within a conference at Emerge is uh, is React Miami. Is that right, Michelle? Yes, exactly. So wh why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about React? Sure. So the React Miami conference is a two-day conference within Emerge Americas that brings together software developers from all over the world, uh, including, of course, our local tech ecosystem for two days of learning about React. And um, these React conferences are found all over the world. Um, they're professional development conferences for the software developers that work in this framework called React. So a little bit of background on that um, is that React is a framework or a library for JavaScript used to write applications. And JavaScript is the most widely used programming language in the world. React is the most widely used framework for that language. So it's absolutely prolific piece of technology that software developers use. And, um, you know, it was developed at Facebook, so it's used to make, you know, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, but it's also used to make Twitter, um, Tesla applica applications, Uber, all of these companies have used um, React or are still using React, and so it's, it's just absolutely everywhere. And it's a front-end technology, so it's kind of like the bridging technology between the Web 2 space and the Web 3 space right now. So our talks, um, kind of like cover both spaces as well. And our, our software developers are kind of coming from a lot of perspectives and places to this conference. Michelle, how'd you get uh, into React? Cause like there's a, 
countless front end frameworks and stuff like that that one could choose. And it's sort of a very subjective uh, decision to pick a framework and sort of uh, sort of stick to it. So what was it that drew you to, to React? Yeah, it was one of those situations where it was kind of chosen for me. So my first job in tech was um, a software developer for Nextair Energy, Florida Power and Light. And I ha I was working through my computer science degree still actually when I started there and got hired as a Java developer. And uh, I think like a couple months after I started, they the team kind of came to me and they were like, we need to start building more web applications, less desktop applications. And the architects have decided that they want to go with React. And I wasn't a part of any of those conversations. Um, and this was like, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago now. So it was really hard uh, still to find developers for it. And nobody at the company really knew it. And so they were like, well, why don't you learn this and then teach everyone? <laughs> I don't know why it was like, maybe like the new kid kind of thing. But like, um, yeah, I kind of jumped in and learned React. There was one other developer there that knew it already. So he guided me. He was like my senior engineer mentor. And um, yeah, just uh, had to build a few applications for the company with it and stuck with it ever since. So is, is Facebook supporting this conference at all? Or have they sort of like, they're hands off on the whole React community now? Um, they're not. Uh, they have their own conference that they do every year. And um, I like I'll say that uh, they didn't sponsor it, but um, they are sending quite a few of their engineers between um, their various like um, projects like Instagram, Meta, uh, et cetera. So we'll be meeting some of their engineers here. Give us a bit of a preview of some of the programming of React Miami. Like what, you know, if, if obviously it's, it's, a, it's a conference geared towards the developer community, but, you know, what should people expect during the two days? Yeah, uh, so this is like kind of like the, kind of like my love, this project. Um, so uh, I'll just preface this by saying like um, when I went into tech, um, there was definitely like this narrative that was like, you have to leave South Florida to have a successful career in technology or be like a software developer for a great company. And born and raised here, I just like rejected that. There was no way I was able to leave this area. Like I couldn't. Um, and so when Mayor Suarez, you know, the, the famous tweet and then all the attention and energy came here. It was like kind of like the, the moment was right for doing a React conference. So with that said, um, the design of the conference is to provide the professional development, provide the connections to these speakers who are literally world famous speakers and developers in this area. Um, and to provide the, the forum for software developers to learn from them. Um, but also it is about Miami and South Florida as well. So when you come to the conference, um, you know, unlike a lot of other conferences, you fly into a city, you spend a couple of days learning, and then you fly out and you maybe not, are not even connected at all to what's going on in the city. Um, you know, we're within Emerge Americas, this is Miami Tech Week. And on top of that, some of our speakers are from Miami, like Gregory Johnson is on the roster. Um, Ariana Techy is on the roster and Rick Blaylock from Up at Jupiter is in the speaker lineup as well. Um, so it's, you know, about this kind of like high level, um, you know, React conference with like these world famous speakers um, talking about, you know, different technologies, but it's also about showing the world what we have in Miami and um, the, the kind of like tech excellence that is already here as well. Tell us a little bit about um, you've been involved in uh, like local coding initiatives and, and local uh, the application of tech to improve our local communities for a while, right? With Code for Palm Beach, Code for South and all these other uh, things. So like, how'd you get into that? And tell us a little bit more about like why that's important to you. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of um, what Livio and Gregory were building at Code for South Florida. I didn't, I didn't get to work with them on that, but Code Palm Beach is one that provides free coding lessons to students um, in South Florida. And I love both of these initiatives and everything like this, including Code Art too, which I'm a supporter of, 
because it breaks down the barrier to entry in technology and it also provides um, kind of like a different perspective of what like careers in software and what coding looks like. Um, so yeah, so like what I love about, um, you know, Code for South Florida is doing is it's framing technology from a civic tech perspective. So how do we as citizens engage with technology um, for our communities? Code Palm Beach, just free uh, coding lessons, because obviously these courses can be very expensive and they can be very challenging and hard to feel supported in. Um, and then Code Art just brings like a very like creative perspective as well that focuses on girls specifically. So um, yeah, all of this is just to create like more inclusivity uh, and more accessibility in the tech space because aside from like any kind of like financial barrier or educational barrier, like where do you even go to like learn these things? There's also like gatekeeping and imposter syndrome that can be very like hard to overcome as well. And then there's the whole other aspect of like accessibility. So um, I met Beth originally at a hackathon, um, I think a couple years ago, two years ago now when a uh, attendee a participant requested ASL interpretation because they were deaf and um, ever since then been working with her and learning with her but like one of the kind of like mind-blowing like eye-opening moments of many working with Beth was um, there was uh, a student in a course one time that was deaf uh, learning how to code react and you know we couldn't really figure out like you know is this is this clicking? Is it working? But we didn't even realize like, okay, if we don't have ASL interpretation, um, then even if it's like, even if it's virtual and there's captioning provided, when you're coding, you have like your IDE, or like where you're coding on one screen, you have the instructor on another screen, and then you also have to be reading the captions. And so like trying to read the expression of the instructor, trying to read the captions and trying to read the code and then coding yourself along with it. This is, this is like undoable. This is just like, you can't expect this. So, you know, so you have to provide like, um, you know, these ways for people to be able to participate equitably in order to create inclusivity and diversity in uh, tech. And that includes, um, you know, like not just racial or gender diversity, but also disabilities as well. Yeah, Michelle, what, what you know, for, for the listeners that are not watching on YouTube, why don't you uh, introduce Beth and, and talk a little bit about um, who she is? Because this is definitely a first for the Miami Tech Pod and we're, it's a really neat thing that you brought to to this uh to this podcast episode today thank you i love to talk about beth and i say that kind of laughing because like i know beth and i are going to have a conversation because i think every time i do something like this we talk about beth and beth is like she's signing about herself right now so everything that <laughs> i say is kind of like she's saying it about herself <laughs> but um so yeah, so Beth is the founder of the WAG group, so Workplace Accessibility Group, where she uh, does consulting for workplaces on how, how to make these workplaces more accessible. And um, in addition to this, obviously she's an ASL, uh, American Sign Language interpreter, and she does a lot of tech events um, and done a lot of uh, events down here in South Florida specifically, but recently started also doing very national tech conferences too. So Michelle, can you tell us a little bit more about your work at G2i? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a program director for developer health at G2i. G2i, it's, it stands for good to the internet, if that helps remember the name, but it's a developer marketplace. So we do the technical vetting for React, React Native and Node developers, and then we match them to the companies of our clients. And what I recently came in to do was lead programming for developer health. So we're the first developer marketplace that pr prioritizes developer health, anything that supports mental, physical, emotional health of software developers. And so what I do there is I um, I'm working on these initiatives that that can support that mission. So, um, you know, React Miami is actually part of it because there's a couple key aspects of React Miami um, in order to like kind of support the, you know, experience for developers at React Miami. You know, we're making sure that they have access to the botanical gardens across the street, providing like a way to use like a meditation app if they need. 
um, like places where they can like rest and relax. Um, so there's like all of these different aspects of it to support them. And we have like, a, you know, sunrise yoga as well. So React Miami is one aspect. Um, another thing that we'll be launching pretty soon is our developer health fund. So this is an allocation uh, of funds that software developers can apply to withdraw from uh, anything that can support their health. So this can be for maybe prescription medication. This can be for um, a surgery, but it can also be for PTO if you're a freelancer and you don't, you can't afford to like take the time off. Or it can be even for something like couples counseling or um, babysitting or daycare, something like that. Like anything that can help support mental, physical, emotional health. Um, that's another thing. And then we're also working on um, coming up later in the year, retreats for developers, and then releasing a, um, a restful work operating system, which is a guide to working in a restful way that you don't burn yourself out and then um, kind of have to go through this recovery period and then go through the cycle all over again. Um, and then lastly, four day work week, we are, we practice the four day work week or the 32 hour work week is really kind of more accurately how we practice it. And um, we provide consulting and a guide on how to adopt that in your workplace as well. Yeah, Michelle, th th this seems like an extremely important part of, of building like a, a you know, long-term tech company, right? Like, you, you know, there's this natural, especially because of like funding rounds and, and, you know, the pressure on growth and all that, there's this natural instinct of companies to just say, let's sprint as fast as possible. Let's build as fast as possible. Let's ship as fast as possible because, um, you know, like either a, this arbitrary goal that was placed for the project or B, um, you know, pressure that stems from like, you know, investors all the way down. Um, but I'd, I'd love to to get your thoughts on the state of that aspect of tech, right? Like we've, you know, had a bit of a up up and down um, and, and different mentality of, you know, tech companies building from, you know, the days of Facebook's move fast and break things and hackathons and staying up for 24 hours and all that. But do, do you feel like, you know, writ large in the industry, that aspect of, um, you know, sustainable working hours, actually preventing burnout. Like, is that getting better at all? I feel like the divide between those two mentalities is kind of like widening. I don't know. There, there's a lot of companies that are understanding um, the value of work-life balance for several reasons. Um, I mean, there's first the, the health of the employees, but also as a recruiting tool for um like kind of like a bargaining tool or negotiating tool, I should say, in, in job offers for retention, things like that. There's a lot of things about work-life balance and developer health that directly uh, correlate to the bottom line of companies. And then I think that there's like the other side of the coin where there's still a lot of people that are like, no, like they hang their hat on that, like, you know, um, idea of like the stereotypical developer coding all the way until 3 a.m. And they just love doing that. And that's just like, the way they live and it's cultural um, yeah like that tech uh developer culture kind of um thing but i think in my opinion um is like very 2010s that idea and i think in the 2020s it's going to be um you know health work-life balance um and like valuing your employees recognizing them as human beings yeah because i mean I, I got to imagine that like anything, right, you're coding to 4 a.m., you're going to make mistakes. Those mistakes are going to create a lot of technical debt that other people are going to, you're going to have to throw resources at to, to, to fix down the road. Um, it, I've never subscribed to this concept of like, if you pull all nighters, your work product is better. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's actually, there's so much research that shows, first of all, like going down to a four day work week actually makes you more productive. Um, most companies don't lose any productivity. A lot of them report gaining 20 to 40% um, increases in productivity when they go to a four-day work week. Of course, there's more to making that change than just chopping off a day of the week. Um, but one of the things that like a framing that like the founder of G2I came up with that I think helps people understand it a little bit better is that um, 
kind of comparing your developers to professional athletes. So professional athletes like Olympians, they have rest uh, integrated into their workouts, into their training. Like you can't ask like an Olympian to train as hard as possible five days a week and then expect them to be able to perform at the Olympics at their top level. They're going to be completely burnt out or they're going to be injured. And so you can kind of make that parallel too when you like run your developers in this marathon manner they burn out in the same way that um, injuries for athletes are very unpredictable. Like an athlete can get injured. They can be fine the next morning, or it could completely end their career. The same thing happens with burnout and developers like, you know, okay, maybe I'll just get a good night's sleep or, you know, maybe I'm going to leave your company because I can't work like this anymore. Or maybe I quit tech altogether. So burnout is like very unpredictable. And so if you find a way to pace your developers, like athletes are paced and you help them create this rhythm where they can perform at their best when it's most necessary, then you get like much better work. You decrease that technical debt that you're talking about too, because there's this really interesting Harvard study that I read where it's saying like six hours or less of sleep is like the equivalent to two drinks. And like, obviously, like we don't just sit at our desk, like drinking alcohol, like, you know, most of our bosses, like, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for all of us on the call. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's have, you, have you met day. Brian? <laughs> I mean, have, have you met Brian Brosnan? <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, like, usually, you know, it's kind of frowned upon. I'll say I've never had a job where I could like sit down with like two whiskeys and like code something that's going to go out to like, you know. Uh, a couple hundred thousand users. <laughs> Michelle, you clearly haven't heard of the, what is it, the Balmer curve? The Balmer's peak. At, yes, Balmer's yeah. peak, yeah. Wait, yeah. What, what is this? I, I, I don't know what we're talking about here. <laughs> Do you want to explain it right? <laughs> sure, sure. So legend has it that uh, Steve Balmer of Microsoft fame uh, declared that your coding performance improves for each additional drink until a point and then it drops precipitously <laughs> and so it's Thanks. considered this uh balmer's peak where like after two beers you are a legendary coder but after three you are basically a degenerate sort of <laughs> a useless person <laughs> like so. get him out of here <laughs> i can't believe this is actually a thing <laughs> this is a thing <laughs> Do, in coding in in nerd circles anything can be a thing right and so it's sort of that's uh, you make something up to be an excuse to drink more or to uh, like fill your hack clown with beers or whatever it is you know so. should we run this as an experiment someone has had to for sure like <laughs> run it as an experiment like measure against it i mean yeah absolutely there's probably a whole subreddit of this of really <laughs> treating the, like giving this the full scientific method and stuff you know yeah, Michelle, you, you brought up something a minute ago that I think was is really interesting because um, clearly there's, as you said, these two different schools of thought. There's still like the cultural, like, you know, move fast, break things. We want to like go, go, go um, and build as fast as humanly possible. Um, and then there's the other aspect of it. But, you know, the thing that you brought up I thought was important was like, because the market is actually changing, right? Like there's all of this develop demand for developers, demand for engineers, you know, all over the industry, there's more startups than ever. There's more capital flowing to companies than ever. Then you, you almost have a bit like this supply and demand imbalance that allows uh, developers to optimize for working conditions. Is that, is, was that your, your overall point? Cause I want to make sure we, we drill down on that aspect. Yeah. And I think that's like a huge point too, is like, if you're struggling, if there's like that cognitive dissonance of like, how do I cut out eight hours and get 40% more work? Like that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I think it's worth exploring from the employee retention and recruitment aspect as well. There's like, you know, so many different stories and, and things to share around this, but of course, we're all familiar with the big tech companies. We know that they can offer the most money. We know that they can take the biggest risk with talent. They can hire people that, you know, might not work out, but it's not really going to hurt them too much. Like, so they can, you know, go through so many candidates. Most companies can't do that. They can't really afford <clears throat> to hire in that way, which makes it really hard to get talent and to attract talent. And so I think at this point, you know, um, 
we have quite like a bit of history of what it's like to work at these big tech companies, what the culture is like. Um, you know, they can be very like focused around like a certain kind of person. Maybe they're not necessarily as inclusive as people would like. Also, you know, there's a lot of expectations for maybe working on the weekends or working at night. Um, it's very stressful. All of these things that make the turnover rate for developers, you know, go, you know, a couple of years ago, it was like a developer would stay at a company for like two to three years. And now it's like one to two years. <laughs> like the turnover rate for software developers is like really, really high. It's very expensive. It costs a, roughly about 150% of a developer's salary to replace them. Um, so if you can figure out other ways to compete for talent outside of like base salary offers, which you can, most people cannot match like a Google offer or a Facebook offer, but like what they can do is say, Hey, we offer a four day work week. Hey, we don't ping you on Slack on the weekends. Um, you know, if you, we respect, if you need time for like doctor's appointments, we don't make you feel bad if a family emergency comes up, like workplace culture, work-life balance is what people really want at G2I. We're a smaller company. Um, we've been expanding and hiring and we've found that like these work-life balance offerings, they can make a difference between like 40 and $60,000 of base salary offers. And we're getting way higher quality um, candidates applying for our jobs that have like really high up roles at huge companies that are just like, I can't work there anymore. I can't work in this lifestyle. Like we had somebody interview that literally broke down like the cost value of the four day work week compared to another offer that they were getting. And we're like, for me, this is like the same offer. Um, even though we were offering significantly less base salary, it's that value and work-life balance. Michelle, I, so let's dig in a little bit on some of that. So like the average term length of like working at a workplace, you know, how much of that though is driven by just the, it's, you make so much more money by jumping from company to company and moving than you do staying at like in a sort of uh, straight hierarchy in your company. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I mean, that's the stories I've been hearing is that everyone goes from one Fang company or whatever Fang is called now to mm -hmm. another, because every six months you get a re up, you get a, a an L six to an L seven or whatever it is. And you're making a million bucks before you know it, you know, and like how, how much of it is that versus, um, you know, traditional sort of job patterns and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it really depends on the developer. And it's a good point too, because I mean, I've been in that seat as well. Like, you know, you get locked into, you were getting a, a big company, it's a great company, but they're like, you know, we only, we only do pay raises at this percentage. There's no breaking out of that. Um, with that said, um, there's like a couple of surveys that have come out recently. There was a really great one on LinkedIn, um, too, that was kind of talking about, uh, the competitiveness of the market and like what, um, candidates were valuing and, um, millennials in particular, um, are valuing work-life balance benefits over salary. Um, but salary and work-life balance, um, benefits, I think they were either at a tie or work-life balance was actually a little bit higher. So um, people are really like, there is that one aspect of, um, you know, get a higher salary, but that's kind of like from the perspective of there's nothing else of value in these companies except for the money. And then when you bring more value to the companies, then you can offer like a different angle of, um, yeah, what that like negotiation process can look like this reminds me of the mark cuban uh quote from south by southwest this year where he said there's no such thing as a career anymore everyone's a free agent mm -hmm. and it's it's really interesting because it, it goes back to your sports uh you know your 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 founders um professional athlete analysis where it's like you know some of these individuals are such significant contributors to companies that um you you almost like have a there almost needs to be like a, like, like a agency repping, uh, software developers, uh, the, the way that sports talent, uh, you know, gets placed into jobs because of their, of, you know, all, all of the intricacies of, of the value that they provide all of the, um, you know, 
the, that de demand and supply imbalance that we're talking about. So I feel like that could be an interesting iteration of of where tech talent goes, and in, in you know have, having some of these high performers actually represented by professional uh, agents placing them in jobs because of um, you know how efficient this marketplace is and how many options they have. Yeah, exactly. In a way, that's really kind of a good way to describe what we're trying to do at G2I as well. You know, it's not it's not just like you pass our technical and then you're in our marketplace and then here are our job postings that are exclusive to you. We work with the clients and we work with the developers to to make that match. That's good. And then if it's like not working out or like, OK, let's find you a new team. <laughs> so, Michelle, you know, Tons of companies are now based down here and they're all trying to compete for talent. How do you recommend South Florida companies compete now that everything so much has kind of gone remote? And so these developers can work for any company in the world. How do they kind of get a leg up? Yeah, I feel like we need a whole nother episode of this. <laughs> like how South Florida companies can compete on the market. But yeah, I, I um, you brought up a really good point. Um, remote work is huge. I mean, honestly, there are some really great companies in South Florida, and I really do appreciate them prioritizing hiring local talent or bringing in talent to the area. But I'm also like just realistically speaking, part of a developer community online, too, that's global. And the software developers don't want to be in person again. Like at, at the very best, they just want the option. But after COVID, you know, a lot of people move closer to their families again to have that support. And, um, you know, a lot of us had like a really big wake up call, um, you know, between like what is valuable in your life, between like career and family and friendships. And I think about like, you know, being in that mindset of like struggling between like, do I move out to California or do I stay here? Like how much am I missing out on? And now in retrospect, it is crazy to think that I would leave South Florida to go work for a company in California. Like, I'm really going to move to California, like nothing against them. But like, no, I'm not going to. I love this place. I love my home. My whole family is here. My in-laws are all here, like my friends, like, you, you know, so I think like um, the job search and competing on the market is like way, way higher if you don't open up that possibility for remote work. Um, and then of course, like the South Florida companies, again, they're just like not all offering the same as like the San Francisco companies even still. So I think the work-life balance is is another um, thing to really lean into and explore. And I just saw even, um, which I, I'm looking forward to hopefully connecting and talking about more, but AJ Yon, I think I just um, started following on Twitter. Uh, I believe his company called Bite Check local South Florida tech company. And he just went to the four day work week and he's been hiring engineers and Ariana, the techie has been hiring engineers too. So I want to pick her brain about what, you know, how she's going about that too. So there's companies finding success with it. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, companies that are obviously struggling, to, you know, this is awesome. Um, Michelle, Thanks so much for for being here on on the pod. I mean, I I think this was like one of the more fascinating conversations. Like, really deep dive into the state of being uh, a, a, an engineer at you know a, t a tech company, and uh, you know I I just really appreciated your insights. Thanks for 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 joining. Do you want to? Um, this is like the the plug part of the podcast. I mean, <laughs> obviously we we talked about. Um, about the conference a little bit, but like anything else you want to just drop before we, before we wrap here? Um, yeah, like I just want to say, um, come out to Emerge Americas. Technically React Miami tickets are like, we hit our ticket sale goal. So <laughs> that's like super exciting. Um, but if you're around Emerge Americas, we're going to be in the, uh, in their expo area. So come say hi, happy to talk more about it and introduce you to our tech sponsors and our developers, um, that are going to be around the conference. And I would be remiss not to also shout out a big thank you whenever I can to Melissa Medina for, um, immediately seeing the value of what we were building with React Miami. And then, of course, opening up her conference to host us. Uh, I think it's just such a testament to our local ecosystem that there are giants here like Emerge Americas that are so uh, generous. So, 
Melissa is a good friend of the pod. We, we, <laughs> we love her and appreciate all of work that, that she does. Um, we're also really excited about Emerge. Um, one programming note for everyone. I alluded to it at the front of the episode or, you know, the beginning of the episode, but uh, our, our very own Will Weinrob is going to be on stage um, on Tuesday at 1235, a panel with uh, the co-founder of Doodles, Jordan Castro. Mm-hmm who I believe goes by Poopy. And he uh, they're going to be talking about building brands on blockchain. It is um, going to be really neat to see Will, uh, you know, in, in front of however many thousands of people. I mean, his he's obviously, um, you know, a- a- already rock star status, but what, what, what a platform for him. We're really proud of him. It's going to be neat. So that's it. Thanks so much for, for joining, Michelle. Of course. No, it was a pleasure well, well, being here. Thank you for asking me to join. We'll we'll, uh, we'll see you on the uh, expo floor. Yes. See you in a couple days. All right. Take care, everyone.